Good evening. My name is Latika Gupta, and I work as director of projects at the Shergil Sundaranath Foundation. On behalf of SSAF, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today. As friends of Vivan Sundaran, we remember and celebrate him a year after his passing on 29th of March, 2023. Your presence here speaks of the warmth, respect, and admiration with which Vivan and his work that cut across disciplinary categories and broke new ground since the 1960s was regarded across the board. Vivan Sundaram, artist, activist, curator, organization, organizer, institution and community builder. The program this evening has accordingly been planned across multiple registers. Outside in the foyer, when you were having tea, many of you would have viewed three of Vivan's video works River Garden, Turning, and the Brief Ascension of Marian Hussain. We'd also like to thank Avijit Mukul Kishore, whose assemblage of films on Vivan and his work was screened just prior to this. Anuradha Kapoor has curated a playlist for Vivan, which can be accessed via a QR code that has been pasted in different locations outside. And if you'd like to share this further on with your friends, instead of scanning it, you can just take a photograph of it and listen to it later. The tracks range from compositions by John Cage to Laurie Anderson and Billie Holiday. And these will also be available on our website, ssaf.in. The list ends with an old favorite of Vivan's, the Rolling Stones rendition of Time is on My Side. Vivan used this as the title for a presentation he had made in 2018 during his retrospective in Delhi. And the present presentation was about films, music, politics, art and activism in the 1960s. It was also in 1969 that Vivan and Geeta were at the Rolling Stones concert at Hyde Park in London. This program is in collaboration with the India International Center and our profuse thanks to the program director, Pepe and her team. Thanks also to the team at SSAF who have worked on all aspects of the program, Saurav Sil, Santosh Sani and Metli Bhatkar. I would like to now thank and also introduce our speakers who are in Delhi, all of them, for this evening as friends and close collaborators of Vivan across many years and who planned this evening with us. Ashish Rajadaksh is a film historian and curator. He's the author of several books, including Ritik Ghatak, A Return to the Epic in 1982, Indian Cinema in the Time of Celluloid from Bollywood to the Emergency, The Last Cultural Mile, An Inquiry into Technology and Governance in India, he co-edited the Encyclopedia of Indian Cinema, wrote In the Wake of Aadhaar, The Digital Ecosystem of Governance in India, and a book of Kumar Shahani's writings, The Shock of Desire and other essays. He co-wrote Overload, Creep, Excess, and Internet from India, and most recently authored John Ghatak Tarkovsky, Citizens, Filmmakers, Hackers, published by SSF Tulika Books in 2023. He's also the series editor of India Since the 90s, six volumes conceived in collaboration with Yes Seven. Uh, Ashish calls himself an occasional curator, but amongst his many uh, exhibition projects, he co-curated with Geeta Kapoor, the Bombay-Mumbai section of Century City, Art and Culture in the Modern Metropolis at the Tate Modern in 2002, You Don't Belong, Festival of Film and Video in China, and Memories of Cinema at the Guangzhou Triennale of 2011. Make Belong, Films in Kochi from China and Hong Kong at the Kochi Musica Triennale, and the ex exhibition Ter Sater, A Very Deep Surface, Manifal and Ranjit Kaleka, Between Film and Video, at the Jawahar Kala Kendra in, in, in Jaipur. And in 2017, he collaborated with Vivan Sundaram and David Chapman on Meanings of Failed Action, Insurrection, 1946. Sabi Ahmed is the director of Ishara Art Foundation in Dubai, his curatorial work and research moved between exhibitions, archives, pedagogy, and theorization. Prior to Ishara, Ahmed was a senior researcher and projects manager at Asia Art Archive, where, in fact, he worked very closely with Vivan and Gita on creating an archive um, of their work. A visiting faculty at the Ambedkar University and was involved in several curatorial projects that included being a part of the curatorial collegiate at the 11th Shanghai Biennale. He has led projects around the digitization of artists' archives, creation of multilingual bibliographies of art, and has organized colloquia and seminars around educational resources. 
His writings have featured in a number of international publications and journals. And most recently, he is the co-author co of the book Mass Traffic with Lantian Singh, published by Kunsthaler Bern and Moose Publishers. After talks by Ashish and Sadiq, the evening will conclude with a sound performance by an artist who is a favorite of Ovant, Hemant Sri Kumar, who has a background in art history, fine arts, and digital media. He creates performance art with synthetic audio using principles of emergence and also produces visual media, including prints and light-based work. He has worked in the past as a program coordinator at Code International Artists Association, researcher at Compart Bremen, and as a data visualization consultant for Widen Infinity. At present, he is faculty at the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Shivnagar University. In 2016, he was invited by Vivan to compose and perform the sound work for The Fall of the Slab, a multidisciplinary two-day live performance and immersive installation at the Kasoli Art Center. Over to you, Ashish. <coughs> thank you very much, Radhika, for that introduction, and thank you all for coming. And uh, I am sort of presuming that many of you are here because you, are, you would have known Vivan. Um, many of you would have been friends of his, and uh, I guess we are all going through our own individual acts of coming to terms with the fact that he left us a year ago today. Um, it's, it's never easy, and uh, you know, we, we, as we deal with the situation, as we try and come to terms with the fact that, you know, that he is not with us anymore, it obviously becomes like a two, you know, there are two aspects to it, I think. I mean, you know, one of them is that there is Vivan, one's friend, and then there is Vivan Sundaram, the major artist, and uh, it seems as though we have to have necessarily responsibilities to both. Um, and as we have an individual sense of, you might say, mourning, um, we also then, I think, you know, when a major artist leaves you, um, a sense of his life's work, you know, you get a sense of a much bigger picture of the, the, the span that he, that he covered uh, and our ability to look at it all together. When Viman uh, passed away a year ago, um, we saw this incredible outpouring of you know, comments, responses, obituaries in many places, and we did not know the range of people who had some kind of an investment in who he was and, and, and what work he did. Um, but that particular Vivan that was very often sort of reproduced um, was, shall we say, a canonical Vivan. There was a certain, very often it was, you know, there was a certain set of high points, as there always is in an artist's work, you know, certain key moments that define the artist. Um, and uh, it's important to do that. It's important to actually have a sense of what that big scale is. But it's also then, as we're looking back on what that artist was, to have a, 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 a different and sometimes a more complex understanding of this. I was actually reminded of this thing when I, uh, I think it was, you know, and, and this happened in many, many comments by friends and obituaries. I think it was Molaishi Hashmi who said, uh, and we were talking about this soon after he passed away, and, you know, he said, such a major artist. But I never understood one thing about Vivan. Why did he give up painting? You know, I mean, what was the reason for why he gave up painting? Um, now, of course, it's not a question that can be easily answered, but it is a question I'm going to, I think it's an important question. It's a question I'm going to try and answer today. Um, as you know, uh, I mean, the film that was shown earlier that was put together by Abhijit Mukul Kishore, and there was a certain um, history of the person that Vivan was. And we have now um, this book on the Kasoli project, which is available outside. And an enormous archive of um, what Vivan was in those early years, which um, has, been, has been quite a, quite a revelation. I mean, there's been quite a lot of new, new material that's emerged from that time. Um, but it does seem, when you look back on those Kasoli years, um, you know, that Ivy Lodge and the artworks that were there, that it was a time of innocence, a time when it felt that you could make art and still enjoy life, when we were young and sure to have our way, as the song goes, when politics was still relatively straightforward. Then the 1990s arrived and Vivant's work changed. I think his last big exhibition, solo exhibition of oil on canvas was in 1990. Um, and he did, he moved on, he did something else ever since then. And that, that change is what I'm really interested in wanting to track because it does seem 
politically in the light of the situation that we are all in now, that that moment becomes a very important one for us to return to as we try and track an aesthetic practice for our, our historical present, as it were. In many ways, change was drastic. Um, what you see in front of you here is uh, Archaeologies of War um, that is part of Long Night, a series of works that I'm going to primarily focus on, which are actually charcoal works that he made in between 1987 uh, and 89. But we'll be moving both back and, and, and forward. Uh, what I plan to do here is that I want to sort of move forward to tracking a certain kind of basic change that I think took place in Vivant's work in approximately the year 1990. Uh, it is a year, a period that I've been very, very interested in personally. Um, you know, I have, I mean, uh, Latika mentioned it, this book series called India since the 90s, which Tulika has been publishing, uh, which is different authors. I mean, do suggest a period that we know well through experience, but haven't really got theoretical or intellectual distance from. It's too recent in time. But it is a, it's a, it's a period of fundamental transformation, it seems to me. And Vivant's work does have something to say to that particular transformation. Now, while what he did in this time was, was radically different, it is also the case that when you go back to what he was doing, say, from the 60s or what he did sometime in the early 70s, the collages that he made, or in 1984 when he made um, the first really big mixed media works, I mean, Signs of Fire in 1984 in the context of the Indira Gandhi assassination and the events that followed, um, you actually start seeing a Vivan who had already started, shall we say, chafing against the idea of the oil on canvas person. You know, that particular idea of artist was always something that he was moving, uh, giving hints of moving beyond. But the breakthrough that happened was this. Um, in 1991, 92, he made engine oil and charcoal in 1991. In that time, this is called a approaching 100,000 sorties. It came literally as though an explosion of some kind. A drawing of Gulf War terrain, as though caught in mid-explosion, extended from the wall to the floor, where there was a tray of burnt engine oil. A crucial medium here that he used was thick handmade paper through which the oil seeped in. This is called land shift, also from, uh, from uh, engine oil and charcoal. I want to contextualize this transformation that happened between the Vivan that was from the 80s, shall we say, uh, from the 70s and early 80s to this particular Vivan. The Gulf War uh, has been seen commonly as one of the planet's first truly postmodern wars, the first truly informational war, the war that Susan Sontag, for example, in regarding the pain of others, has called a, a techno war. Um, it's called a techno war. Um, and she says, the sky above the dying, filled with light traces of missiles and shells, images that illustrated America's absolute military superiority over its enemy. The flickering green nocturnal photographs of Baghdad have become icons of an era of warfare conducted and photographed remotely at a distance. That same year of 1991 opened, we know in India, an informational revolution and a fundamental change in the character of the Indian state in a way that we have to still entirely sort of still com you know, really com comprehend. The new economic policy pivoted around telecommunications, the effective co-opting of India's administrative machinery for a massive, massive technocratic project. The telecom policy of 1994, the IT Act of 2000 was still to follow. What it did, it seems to me, is that it radicalized art making. Art making and art authorship would gradually transform, expand amid new questions of how, how art was being made, for whom and for and why. Aesthetics took a new turn, I think. Aesthetics, I mean, in a way, they can think of aesthetics from an earlier history of, uh, you know, something to do with taste and something to do with a certain kind of, a, you know, writing of canonical histories. But the radicalization of aesthetics as a certain kind of political front was, was what happened at this point of time, and Vivan was very key in making this happen. It, additionally, I think this is a kind of a aesthetic politics that didn't fit into what were, shall I say, conventional definitions of political work at that point of time. In Vivan's case, the beginning was modest. Um, this is a work called The Penal Settlement that he made uh, in the late 1980s after a visit to Auschwitz. It would, however, signal the beginning of definitive change with a cycle of darkly dystopian drawings in thick charcoal uh, in what would seem to be either top angle images of s or sometimes lateral images, layered views of unremittingly bleak la surfaces and bombed out subterranean zones over which you can just get these, these, these um, 
um, an amalgam of uh, mythic firebirds and aerial weapons of mass destruction, it turned to a more, a more threatening form of state totalitarianism. Archaeologies of war, and on the right hand side I've actually put three images from uh, a documentary called Collateral Murder, which will be familiar to some of you, of you know, a situation taken from American Apache helicopters where you know, the pilots are actually shooting innocent people down and there's this, this, this chatter that was, that was going on. So how do we understand the shift? How do we understand the transformation that's taken place? I've already suggested there was a political shift that happened and it happened also in, in India. I think uh, I'm going to suggest in this short presentation that we create a small lexicon for this and I think that lexicon is going to be important for us to understand Vivan's work as a whole that happens from now. Uh, and I'm going to suggest seven terms and I'll just briefly talk about each of these terms and then I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, the installation that uh, Latika also mentioned which I had the honor of working with Vivan on uh, the, um, the um, insurrection project uh, and I'll end with a little, little epilogue. The seven terms are trace, effigy, the anomic condition and anomy, um, the condition of the eternal present as it were, the void, the zone, the axis mundi, and the subterrain. On the left, uh, 1984 work called Wood and Firefly, and on the right, uh, Imperial Overcast from Engine Oil and Charcoal. Um, on the left, you know, it is, it is possible that what you're seeing is actually, as I said, this is a work that done in 84 in the context of the assassination of Indira Gandhi and what you probably are seeing is the funeral pyre itself um, that is there. On the right hand side, what you're seeing might well be uh, the shadow of something, you know, you could say it's an angel or it's, it's probably an aircraft of some kind. I want to begin with the concept of the trace, as I said, a kind of shadow or a remnant, perhaps a record of an event that had once taken place a history that had once been lived. Um, I want to think of this trace as an effigy, a figura, a condition of condensation, and whatever it is, you can find a number of words for it. It becomes a particular sort of aesthetic contribution, I think, at that time to India, precisely because it is a form that avoids the symbolic. It is not the symbolic. It is actually struggling against being a sort of place within a symbolic uh, order, as it were. Um, I said earlier that uh, it's always difficult to, to lose a major artist who is also a friend and unfortunately it happened to me twice. Uh, we lost Vivan a year ago and a little more than a month ago we lost Kumar, uh, Kumar Shahani. Um, Vivan and Kumar were of course, as you know, very, very old friends, old comrades and uh, there are these stories about them watching movies, I think it was in England in the 1960s, Kumar has written about how they used to actually watch films going into movie theaters as though entering a deep mine and then coming out of that mine as though they were miners into the, into the, into the sunlight. Kumar um, had, I mean, they're of course very different kinds of artists. It's very difficult to put them together in any single structure, but there was a certain set of concerns that Kumar was talking about, which I think are relevant to this time, this, this idea of the effigy and the trace. Um, Kumar was speaking about a condition, and, and this is in the early 80s, when, as he put it, common values and common meanings are no longer understood or accepted, and new values and new meanings have not developed. That is to say, the old is gone, but the new has not come in. It's a situation of an in-betweenness, you know, a sort of a, a situation of being trapped. For him, it's a trap in the, in the, um, it's a trap of a situation when religion, uh, so modes of societal regulation, government and occupational groups have failed to exercise moral constraints on an increasingly unregulated capitalist economy. This is a condition that he names the condition of anomie. Uh, it's a condition that he takes from the, the work of uh, Emil Durkheim and it's a condition that he thinks of as one of the static present where to pursue a goal which is by definition unattainable is to condemn oneself to a state of the perpetual present, okay? This is his, his idea and he was very interested in it. What more can the future offer than the past? What more can the future offer to him than the past since he can never reach a tenable condition nor even approach any glimpse ideal? Uh, I want to mention the fact that I thought this was an art intervention and I think that this particular idea of the present as it was discussed at that time but I have subsequently learned that it is actually something that even political theory had been talking about. So Upendra Bakshi, 
uh, who wrote this um, text called Taking Suffering Seriously, had actually mentioned Rajni Kothari's book, Politics in India, where he uses the concept of anomie in, as a political phenomenon to describe a virtual non-membership in the nation and a deep schism in society that leads to violence and anomie through the condition of you know, the, the absence of be, being a, a member of the nation state, as it were. Such a trace, then, is distinct, I have suggested, from the symbol. It is something more provisional, a kind of material absent present that is yet to be interpreted. Crash site from Long Night. Archaeology of war, too. Spotlight on landscape. I want to uh, mention a couple of autobiographical sort of conversations, uh, memories with Vivan and, and conversations. This one was happened was that it was actually in in, in Maharani Bagh, which is where um, Vivan was working at that time, you know, in the, the first floor of Maharani Bagh, where he actually had quintal of grass uh, in front and ten foot beam on the right hand side, and he was working on both those those, those paintings at once. And uh, you know, I, I had a long conversation with him about uh, about quintal of grass that was that was in front, and it was a conversation about protagonists. You know, who is a protagonist in, in, in art? This arose in part because uh, I proposed to him that the figure in, uh, in Quintal of Grass looked a little bit like Tarkovsky's uh, stalker. You know, I said that, you know, sort of similarity. And Vivan actually nodded and said, yeah, well, actually, it was somewhere at the back of my mind, which led me to then propose to him that, you know, the stalker in Tarkovsky, as we all know, is somebody who walks his people and walks us actually through a treacherous zone. Uh, the zone is a concept that Vivan would use in Long Night. There are a series of works called Entering the Zone, which, uh, which I will show you in a minute. But the, the protagonist then is somebody who actually also walks you through this, right? And I had said to him that there were some very famous protagonists that he had had, Big Shanti being one, you know. Um, there were these, there was Bhupen, there were other artists, there was his father, um, there were, you know, uh, the Sikh figure in the 1984 painting that he had done. There was somewhere in Maloyashri. There were a whole series of protagonists that were there. And what we now have is the protagonist absent, you know, the protagonist being replaced by uh, a void, I should just say. Um, the protagonist disappears. Um, I have been fascinated by this this idea of a, of an empty space that is that is you know an emptiness of where the protagonist once was. This is a work called Entering the Zone, um, which. Um, This is called Entering the Zone 3, uh, but we'll keep it Entering the Zone 1 for a moment. There's a possibility that such a zone that I'm talking about, an absent protagonist, bears some resemblance to what Partha Chatterjee, speaking about Sadat Hassan Manto, also speaks about as being in the eternally in the present. It is a present, says Chatterjee, of pure uncertainty, of unrelieved dangerousness, without the security of an anchor in some pre-given idea of the good. So there is no anchor in a pre-given idea of the good that's there. Whatever future it may posit would be a future in which the certainties of civil so social norms and constitutional proprieties are put under challenge, where rights and rules have to be seemingly negotiated afresh. Who can decide political good except those who go through the dangerously creative process of politics itself, he asks, for there is violence in the air. In such a situation, to seek refuge in history and statecraft is to return to the comfort of the familiar. That is what most of us prefer to do because we are not great storytellers, nor perhaps all of us great artists. The discomfort that many feels with the goings on in what I have called political society, this is Chatterjee speaking, is I think because it raises the specter of pure politics. Within the vertigenousness of what could once be a top ang at once be a top angle shot of an industrial dystopia, or who knows, a horizontal space of a kind of subterrain literally beneath the earth. If you say that this is a top angle of something, or it's actually a horizontal space and you're looking at something underground. We had a range of images that could have expression its origins, humanoids that could be from Fritz Lang Metropolis. These are details from their earlier work. Um, part human, part metal, perhaps inside the mines or factories meeting their comic book bosses. Allegorical landscapes. All this is work from Long Night. This is the kind of work that I think the grammar is starting to define itself. You, know, you get the figure ground, you get the embedding of data in the thick surface, you get the map. Um, I want to move, uh, this is the collage, shifting elements, the collage form, uh, and the collage of course returns then to some of the experiments it done in the early 1970s. 
the axis mundi. Um, on the left hand side, allegorical landscape from long night, and on the right, axis mundi in some collaboration combines. The uh, idea of a certain fig entity, you know, that, uh, you know, like, I mean, the axis mundi is seen to be, um, you know, a cosmic axis, a world axis, a world pillar, a center of the world, where the heaven connects with the earth, or by some accounts, the present connects with the future. Sometimes known as the navel of the earth, differently presented with natural objects, such as a mountain or a column of smoke or products of human manufacture, like a tower, which is happening here, a maypole, a cross, a steeple, a totem pole, a pillar, a spire. Now, this is almost like, shall I say, the spine that we have. And this is something that works again and again with one. In fact, I was thinking uh, yesterday, Gita, that you know, when we were talking about uh, the history project, that the railway track may actually have a role similar to this, you know, the spine of the work, you might say. It is, it is an idealized situation where it actually sort of relates, you know, the, the present, as I said, the eternal present to an unimagined whatever, something that was either before or afterwards. The map. I'm referring not only, to, on the left-hand side, we have map scroll monuments. Um, this was a work dated in 1997. And on the right, it's a work called Rigging from Riverscape. This is a set of works that he had done in England, in northern England, at the River Tees, at, in Teesside, uh, where he was working with, um, um, and Teesside is, is a center of manufacturing and refers actually to epic histories of, of shipbuilding. Um, and, and I was actually thinking of, you know, this famous film called um, The Wind That Shakes the Barley uh, by Ken Loach, which is actually set more or less in this, in this area. Rigging uh, is part of a series of works that actually has, you know, uh, you know kind of a map-like map -like structure. Um, you might say. We move to a very different sort of situation, the subterranean. This is, on the left-hand side, elephants from bad drawings for dose. And on the right, burnt mound from terra optics. Now, these are not two works that you can ordinarily put together. But I think once you do that, you get, do get some kind of a connection. On the left-hand side, there are a, a series of elephants which are actually embedded. You might say almost call it a dreamscape of some kind. And he uses his stitches. He uses actually stitched uh, thread to navigate something. On, you know, and on the right-hand side, you get a mound. And, in, and around that mound, he's used a very, very contemporary technology, fiber optic cable. Um, the effigy again, the shroud. Moving from different connecting points like ants building tunnel routes marked from one spot to another. The optical fiber cable is the material that defines the industrial, the, 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 whatever, the, the digital revolution, the informational revolution in India. In a way, it's almost a bit like um, the, the fantasy that McLuhan had about the electric light bulb that was pure information. Um, the incredibly thin wires literally glisten with light as they carry information. They're flexible glass or plastic fiber that can transmit light from one end to the other. Uh, the, the national optical fiber network that we have in India is the basis upon which the, the, the new economy is being worked out. You know, Bharat Net dragging connectivity in India down to block level and to 250,000 gram panchayats using all existing fibers of public sector undertakings, BSNL, Railtel, the power grid, and laying incremental fiber wherever necessary is actually the informational highway that's undergirding, you know, the, the nation as we know it, know it today. Um, on the left, map scroll monument again. On the right, terra optics. Night journey from long night. And this is the kind of culmination, I think, that of everything that I have talked about so far. You know, here is where you get the void. Here is where you get the top angle mapping with a kind of vertical subterrain. Here is where you get the axis mundi as well. By the late 1990s, the work changed again um, with a different, a more abstract, and shall we say oceanic imagination. With airplanes, underwater sea cables, primitive, even prehistoric objects leaving their traces. On the left, carrier from uh, Shelter, which is uh, an installation that he has. On the right, uh, it's called Night on the River from Riverscape. By the time you get to Shelter, you're working with three-dimensional work. You're also working with video. The primitive traces, you know, see, there are only embeddings which are on the side of the boat to which we referred to earlier have now become hieroglyphs or remnants of everyday objects of use embedded on the sides of the boat 
or in the side of the wall in houseboat. This is houseboat. Um, this is what uses a thick, uh, thick paper again. This is houseboat from uh, from shelter. Uh, on the right, uh, you you know once again you have the embedded video beneath the the this uh, object. It's, it's it's like like fire. I uh, want to move to a work, a river carries past that has frankly terrified me. It's a work that I've always thought of as a little bit beyond me. And I wouldn't have had the courage to bring it in, but for actually Geeta's encouragement that I, that I should talk about it. The traces here are large, and they cover an increasingly complex historical storm. The riverine movement is civilizational. It is volatile. And all the elements we discussed now, the void, the map, the axis mundi, the subterranean, are taken in this epic flow. It is not clear to me as to whether we are viewing this from above or laterally. Totemic objects, primitive ritual forms beneath a ground that is heaving. Sirens at sea. Uh, I'm now working towards uh, our insurrection um, project. Um, and I want to actually remain, remember a quote that, that we had used. Uh, the siren is the anthem of the 20th century. You know, the siren, whether it's a military siren or a siren in, in factories and, and, and so on. Uh, on the left is notations on landscape uh, from um, um, Long Night. On the right, uh, abstract forms at sea from Journeys, which were a series of pastel works that uh, Devon had done. This is a diptych, colonial landing from Journeys again. And you're starting to get this particular, what I'm describing as this oceanic imagination. We move now to the installation, um, insurrection that was done. The work comprised of a very large work, it was a container, we called it, a large ship, comprising ex externally of a series of astonishing layers of minimalist abstraction. It's also a reference, as you see here, to the battleship Potemkin, uh, which may not be entirely out of order. The entrance was at once, you could actually go inside it. You entered it. Um, this is the inside of it. Was at once an invitation and a barricade, past the side and then into the hull. It was a space that was directly what I'm describing as the void. Um, inside were a series of lights and an eight channel sound work that defined among other sounds by the siren, the click click of the Morse code. Um, I, I'm, I'm just annotating a couple of things here. Uh, the, the insurrection was, uh, as many of you probably know, about the 1946 mutiny of the Royal Indian Navy, the ratings of the Royal Indian Navy, and the ratings were led, I mean, one of the key figures in, the, in that was a man called B.C. Dutt, whose book, Mutiny of the Innocents, was one of the books that we had, we had used. Um, and we had actually managed to find archival footage of B.C. Dutt himself speaking. And he, he says this, this is Dutt speaking, you know, that Talwa had the wireless office, and we sent, you know, we're going on strike. The word strike was not only, I'll play you his soundtrack, but a lovely line that comes which says, we are on strike and we are closing down. In half an hour's time, the whole British Empire went silent. So this is in a way an early history of the kind of communication infrastructure, the undergirding that, that I'm talking about that emerges in the 1990s, the 1940s. Below we have a, a very famous uh, work. It is the, the Leslie McDonald Gill Cable and Wireless Great Circle Map of 1946. And of course you have the map of the, um, where the, the ships, uh, the, that is to say where the, uh, the, the establishments of the Royal Indian Navy were. Uh, I'll just play you a minute from, um, from um, News came in that the Royal Indian Navy ships in Bombay Harbour had mutinied. And in support of them, the trade unions in Bombay had declared a general strike. 
So it was a terrific crisis. And I felt I really must go down to Bombay and see what's going on. I'll never forgive myself if I miss this opportunity to sit here with Torres Bell. I want to play you a, a short clip of something we actually didn't finally use um, in this uh, work. This was uh, something that we was we were struggling with at that point of time. So uh, one of the things that I think we were very interested in, along with this, was a certain. Um, uh, actually, okay, um, a certain um, legacy uh, of this particular moment as, as a form of political history, you might say, almost an aesthetic history of a political of a political occasion. Um, so Utpal, that's Kallol. We use the song from there, which is uh, a very famous powada that was composed by Hemango Bishwas. Uh, and along with that come these, uh, many of these sounds of communication, there's actually the Morse code that is there. And it ends with um, a, a threat that Admiral John Godfrey makes on the radio. Um, as I said, we didn't eventually use this, but it does, does give you some idea as to what we're talking about. And a series of telegrams that were then exchanged between Bombay and Whitehall and 10 Downing Street, where you, know, you have a situation where actually the, 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 cable, the cable and wireless system more or less collapses, and the military is forced to rely on orthodox modes of communication to, to, to get by. In the present regrettable state of indiscipline in the service, I have adopted this means of addressing the RIN as being the way in which I can speak to the greatest number of you at one time. To start with, every one of you must realize that the government of India has no intention of allowing indiscipline to continue. It will take the most stringent measures to restore discipline using the vast forces at its disposal if necessary. The situation is... Um, I want to actually, uh, just moving just into a rather more contemporary moment, um, when we had this installation in Bombay, uh, Anshia Dutt, who um, was the wife of uh, BC Dutt, came to visit us. And we had a number of other um, very, very important activists. Many of you will recognize uh, Susan um, Abraham, um, who's the wife of Vernon Gonsalves, who um, the name will be familiar to many of you here. Um, I want to conclude now um, with another imagination. This is my little epilogue for Vivan, uh, but it's also something that I think emerges from this, from this body of work, which I have this thing I'm trying to track. The fallen mortal and, oh, what did I do? Sorry, I think my step came soon. The fallen mortal and the condor. Um, in many ways, this is going to be my most, I mean, the entire presentation, I imagine, is slightly speculative, but this is my most speculative section as I return to another sort of trace, another sort of effigy. 
1993, Vivan exhibited Memorial for the first time. That work, I'm sure, is very well known to everybody here. Uh, when he wrote, when he, when he uh, exhibited Memorial, actually he asked me to write a short text which appeared in the original catalog. And I want to uh, mention a brief paragraph from it. It was titled, One of Those Figures Then Died. And the quotation goes, there was the law, there was the name of the law, and there were several technologies of recording the biography of the emerging nation state. And there was the whole world that the official definitions chose to leave out, refused to support, or sometimes even to acknowledge. And there was thus the affirmative in art, a sense of personal integration which is reflected in the artist's life and art, including the interrelationships between figures that he paints. This last line is actually from Gita's uh, partisan views about the human figure, which uh, came in the catalog of the Place for People exhibition. One of those figures, one of those figurative figures, uh, fig arts of figures of figurative art, then died. As we stepped out of the internal world of an art that could at one point hold its metaphoric own against the world. We may begin to acknowledge that he is dead. The artist requires us to do so, that he was killed in particularly brutal circumstances, and not very long ago. Also that the original act was with some deliberation shown of conscious meaning, the better his killers probably thought, to make him a generic entity, to make the physical act as senseless as possible. So that a particularly perverted link may be made between the intensity of the act and the alleged intensity of the feeling afflicting its symbolic value. It was actually meaningless. It was actually symbolically, it had no meaning to it. What we get then in this work, the angel that leaves the body, as it were, is a curious rise after the fall as the spirit is freed. I mean, everyone knows this work, I presume, but basically it's a series of works that take place one after the other when there's a continuous effort to give the man a burial that he did not get. Uh, and at the end of that, you come up with this, uh, the actual sort of moment of freedom that takes place. And the entire process of the pain and the mourning managed. The fall and then perhaps the rise becomes a significant trope when we return our concluding argument back to the trace I talked about, to the remnant signs of something that had once happened, an action that had once taken place. Um, the fallen angel, this is something that I think appears again very commonly in a lot of Vivan's work. Um, the, the, here is a kind of probably a falling meteor, you might say. Um, on the right hand side is 10 foot beam, uh, and this was uh, the other work that Vivan was doing along with Quintal of Grass in Maharani Bagh when I was watching him paint. And he actually was painting it, and suddenly, you know, in a, in a, almost a paroxysm, within 15 minutes, it seemed like he had painted up there what seemed to be something that was falling, and I asked him what that was, and he said it's the, a reference to Icarus, the, the falling figure of Icarus. Um, Icarus, we know, son of the craftsman Daedalus, designed, uh, who designed the labyrinth of Greece uh, and was imprisoned there. So both Icarus and Daedalus left um, Greece with wings that he had fabricated using blankets, clothes, and beeswax, and he had actually warned Icarus not to fly too close to the sun because the, the beeswax might melt and he fell down. And Icarus, of course, did exactly the opposite. He ignored Daedalus' suggestion. He flew too high, the wings fell off, and he fell, fell to earth. The fallen angel is, of course, the angel who has been cast out from heaven, for he has sinned. To me, of course, as you know, an inveterate film studies person, the fallen angel is, of course, Wong Kar Wai's figure, you know, the fallen angels. Um, and it is then a combination then of a hundred things, the fall from grace, the banishment, the missed opportunity, as people pass each other by, of action that takes place just outside the gaze, or waiting for the hour and not knowing our arrival will happen, or yearning for what might have been. And this is now my concluding work, uh, concluding image, with an image that I think in some ways sums up what I have been trying in this short text to explore. The trace, the figura, the effigy, the condensation. This is a work made of pot shards from Patanam, that is in Kerala, and relates to the black gold insulation, which is actually projecting on top of uh, it. Um, shown, however, in the Terra Optics show, which is the work that I was saying, you know, uses this fiber optic cable, which is the cable of information technology right now. Um, to me, the condor, which is what the work is called, the Andean condor, the national icon of Chile and of several other Latin American countries, uh, also takes us back to 
another the one you know another time of the one that is the the old connection with uh, Pablo Neruda and the heights of Machu Picchu. As I think of the vast and lofty skies with its majestic wingspan and soaring flights guiding us as the official Chilean description of its national bird tells us on a transformative journey of ascending to new heights, I want to conclude by returning the imagery that we began with, which is the imagery of the very young Vivan, uh, the Casoli works and so on, and conclude this with a Pablo Neruda poem called The Condor. Uh, I'll read this poem and then uh, Neruda. I am the condor. I fly over you who walk. And suddenly in a wheeling of wind, feather, claws, I assault you and I lift you in a whistling cyclone of hurricane and cold. And to my tower of snow, to my dark eyrie, I take you and you live alone and you cover yourself with feathers and you fly above the world motionless on the heights. Let us pounce upon this red prey. Let us tear life that passes throbbing and lift together a wild flight. Thank you.
to have been pretty fun. Uh, you know, when I received the invitation from Gita and Latika before coming here today, it was a very, I mean, immediate response, I said yes, but it was also a very difficult invitation to accept because when I, when I left, left Delhi um, four years ago, I, I didn't think I'd be coming back to speak about Vivaan, not with Vivaan. So um, what I want to do this evening is um, to present something in the spirit of uh, what, what Ashish did to, to say some things about Vivaan Sundara, the artist to whom we owe a lot. Um, but also to say some things more speculatively uh, about, about all kinds of conversations we would have late in the middle of the night, all the way till early morning about a subject that we kind of left more or less at the end before I moved cities, which was on the theme of the Anthropocene and the planetary. And I thought, let me, let me share what all we were discussing back then around his work rather than do a kind of essayistic uh, presentation about his practice uh, altogether. Um, I feel truly honored to be speaking here today, and I'm sure Vivan touched all of your lives in all kinds of different ways. I first met Vivan when I was a student of art history in MS University of Baroda around 2006, but it was only around 2010 when I was digitizing Gita and Vivan's archive for AAA when a deep friendship started, and that and one that I've cherished dearly. It was one thing to learn about Vivan and be in awe of his work through his exhibitions, his talks, and through books and essays dedicated to him. But it's altogether something else when you see his archive and his obsession with documents, monuments, and history that is both extremely methodical and simultaneously very irreverent. <clears throat> it was really with Gita and Vivan's archive that my own understanding of archives developed, which was to see them as extremely dynamic, see archives, I mean, also Gita and Vivan, but also archives as extremely dynamic as unstable sites that invite you to re-examine history, excavate the subterranes of the historical and political, but also think about history as a playground, a term that Vivan was very interested in. And the archive is a place of constant reconfigurations, augmentations, and projections. So not just the archive as a site of excavation, but also one of projections and augmentations. The archive was a ruse for Vivan, a trick of the subconscious, but also a scrap and debris. Vivan's interest in the analog and the digital made his own archive an even more unstable site, and this could not be better exemplified uh, than through his photo montages and retakes of Amrita, as I went on to digitize and work curatorially with more artist archives in the years to come. I was already primed to see the artist archives as having something very special and particular to offer both philosophically and empirically. It is with artists archives feeding into the tsunami of digital information along with art practices such as Vivan's that interrogated the personal and the historical through it, one had a very palpable sense that to be an archivist in the 21st century is like being an archaeologist in the middle of an earthquake. You're surrounded by sediments that are constantly erupting. The ground is contaminated, radioactive, uprooted and revolting against any epistemological classification you could try and impose on it. The very ground of history, so to speak, is shattered. And it is this shattered ground that I want to speak about today while remembering Vivan as, um, as an artist, as a thinker, as a friend. As philosopher Thomas Nail says, we need a new theory of the earth. For the longest time, and perhaps most prominently since the Enlightenment, people have been accustomed to treating the Earth as a relatively stable site on which history and life are staged. Nail says, and I quote, today the stable ground is becoming increasingly unstable, for some more than others, of course, end quote. Due to the widespread use of global transportation te technologies that are now more, that are now, uh, that with now more People and things are on the move than ever before in history. Vast amounts of materials are in constant circulation as thousands of ships and supply chains move commodities around the world. Alongside these commodities, there are vast bodies of populations, earth, soil, sand, water, money, information, chemicals, and waste, 
that is also being transported, displaced, relocated from one country to another, one continent to another, one city to another, one sea and ocean to another. More than half of the world's plant and animal species have now been forced into migration, and in the midst of all of this, there are at least five cyclones taking place at any given moment uh, on the surface of the planet. Just two weeks ago, around 2,000 earthquakes were recorded in one day in the ocean floors off the coast of Canada. Scientists described this saying, the ocean floor is ripping apart. But I don't invoke this as a dystopic kind of a warning. In this particular case, a new ocean crust is about to be birthed via this uh, magmatic rupture. We can practically see the creation of an entirely new geolo geological strata made of waste, plastic, electronic waste, chicken bones, and other waste that could remain in the fossil record and affect geological uh, formations for thousands, even millions of years to come. Glaciers are melting, water bodies are swelling, land masses are submerging, and yet new grounds are also forming. Karl Marx was not thinking of receding glaciers or greenhouse gases when he famously wrote that all that is solid melts into air. But that is what is literally happening. I can't say whether it was a conscious thesis on Devan's part or an intuition, but his practice understood something of this when he, was, uh, when he made works like Trash, Tracking, Black Gold, Terra Optics. This was an understanding that the Earth is not just an entity, a stable entity, it is a process, a material process continuous with social processes, biological processes, technological processes, and cosmic processes, all of which produce and keep producing the planet. The Earth is not and never was an unchanging or uniformly changing substance following an autonomous kind of logic of its own. The Earth is where geopolitics meets biopolitics meets geoengineering. It is where terra firma meets terra nullis meets terraforming. Small section vantage points. Landscape paintings, you know, Vivan was an art history buff, we all know that, so I thought I'd share something, a painting that we had discussed back in the day. Uh, we used to like discussing Turner. Uh, landscape painting as a genre refigured the planet with dichotomies between nature and culture, and therein establishing a new order of landscape as terra nullis, terra nullis as a prospect to occupy and turn land into property. We learned this from John Berger, someone who Vivan himself greatly admired. We also learned this from Edward Said. In art history, J.M.W. Turner is said to be among the earliest European artists to represent a new and modern figuration of the landscape and the sea that involved a kind of immersion as opposed to a distance. Nicholas Mirzoff, who was in Delhi over a decade ago, had made a fantastic presentation on Turner, where he had said something to the effect that the spectator in Turner's painting was not the disinterested viewer imagined in theories of the sublime that so often took the shipwreck as an example, who was presumed to be able to appreciate the terrible beauty of the scene because there was no danger to him or her, usually a him. Turner's intent, by contrast, was to immerse the spectator. The immersion is at once literal, uh, at, at once a literal place of viewing amongst the waves, being captivated by the power of the scene and a metaphorical deployment of a space of transition between regimes of power. In short, being immersed was to be in crisis. In a way, when you see Turner's painting, you're literally seeing an artist aware of where geopolitics meets the biopolitics meets a planet changing because of geoengineering, as opposed to someone showing you a landscape representing uh, nature and the city representing culture. Fast forward to almost 175 years later, we see a completely imi uh, inverted image of the sea, this time through the work of Singapore-based artist Charles Lim. In his project, Sea State, we did not discuss Charles Lim with Vivan. Uh, sea State examines the biophysical, political, and psychic contours of Singapore through the visible and the invisible lens of the sea. This, by the way, is an image of a location underneath the sea off the coast of Singapore. It is not a basement of some place. It is not a tunnel. Oil is extracted from the earth, and strangely, it's being put back into earth. But when it's being put back into earth, it's being put back into spaces like these. India also has spaces like these under the ocean. 
So now we're seeing an, un, an excavated out, a gorged out image of the sea while the sea swells. Sea State examines the biophysical, political, and psychic contours of Singapore, as I mentioned. Through his research, Lim turned to document Singapore's water bo border markers, physical seawalls, and petrochemical support systems in Sea State 1, uh, which was made in 2005. By the time he got to Sea State 9, he was looking at preclamation, -preclama -preclama where his investigation in expanded to Singapore's land reclamation on coastal waters. Singapore, Malaysia, a lot of Southeast Asia are places which also, in fact, are exporting a lot of land and soil and sand to other countries. Um, China is, in fact, one of China and America are one of the largest exporters of soil and sand, actually, not even soil, to various parts of the world. Um, a lot of that sand, in fact, actually also comes to Dubai to make beaches. Reclaimed land constitutes about 30% of Singapore's total landmass at present. 30%. And the country continues to grow at a steady rate. Beaches in Dubai import sand from Singapore and Malaysia. Mumbai, as we know it, is also reclaimed land. A lot of Hong Kong is. And you can just go on looking. So what is the ground beneath our feet, and what is the ground? Not to mention, of course, um, landfills. Not to mention the fact that Delhi itself has a very large uh, amount of landfill, electronic waste being a very important part of it. When Vivan made trash in 2008, he was not emphasizing the anthropocentric footprint against a natural order. He was not creating a kind of guilty discourse that look what we're doing to the planet. Of course, there were ethical concerns behind, but that's not where it looked like he was coming from. He was, as Chaitanya Sambani would put it in an essay, doing, I quote, an archaeology of leftovers, or what Chaitanya also called, excavating the history of modernism as fragments. He was also situating his work in the aftermath of economic liberalization in India and late capitalism's collapse of all of the promises it made of progress, development, and well-being. Scientific reports show that one ton of electronic waste in landfills carries 16 times more gold and precious metals than one ton of gold ore itself. This should raise some very important questions. Are we looking at a cityscape then, or a landscape, or a landfill? That distinction between the city and the landscape, or the city and the landfill, kind of complicates all of those things. So where do we draw the line in the landfill, whether it's city or landscape? It also beckons the question, what will be the gold mines of the future, and who will be the gold miners exploited to do this work? In other, work, uh, in other words, Vivan's work offers an argument, I, I would say, against the Anthropocene, claiming that human historical markers such as agriculture, the Industrial Revolution, and nuclear threats should not have, have us lose sight of an important lesson of our time, that the environment and society have never been separate systems. The Anthropocene advocates go on about some generalized notion of all humanity being responsible for having done what they did to the planet Earth. Trash is about the Earth, the city, the socio-technical organ system, and what it is doing to itself through the social. This, however, of course, in no way suggests a need for ethical action on the part of society. As much as Vivan was obsessed with installations and materiality, we also know, as Ashish showed, he was equally mindful of the regimes of optics and visibility by which spaces are constructed, whether it's surveillance, whether it's satellite, whether it's uh, uh, cinematic processes. In each print from trash, you're made acutely aware of different vantage points from where the cityscape, landscape, landfill is viewed. From a surveyor's purview, from a drone shot, which back at that time, Vivan would refer to as a bird's eye view, but as, as now more and more drones are becoming apparent and visible all around us, we can see what kind of an optic the drone produces, what kind of an aesthetic the drone produces. Panorama. but also the photomontage and multiple perspectives, and in today's time, deep fakes. It looks like it's one image, it looks like it's maybe one perspective, but it's not, it's not even a collage or a montage of them. It's somewhat a seamless suturing or stitching of them where you, don't even, you can't even tell where they've been stitched. This comes through once again with tracking, where a double channel video installation takes you through a similar cityscape slash landscape slash landfill, this time 
through the optics and techniques of surveillance. That cityscape, landfill, landscape is set on fire. There are figures walking through it, there are cameras, there are sirens. It's a very intense landscape and it's also a very intense soundscape. While challenging a kind of hegemony of the Anthropocene narrative, as, as I would like to see it, it's hard not to turn our attention to black gold. The large installation comprises of discarded local pot shards from Patanam, as uh, uh, Ashish pointed out. The archaeological site forms an imaginary 2,000-year-old port city of Nuziris. Vivan described the layout as suggesting, I quote, an archipelago, <coughs> circumambulating it in person. You experience its clustered miniaturization. The geographical illusion turns into a metaphor. The ar archipelago folds into a playground of infancy, unquote. I remember Vivan narrating that he bought both cheap and expensive peppers when he was making the film. I'm not gonna go into describing each and every image as I'm sure most of you have seen it. Um, and the reason he, brought, he bought both cheap and expensive peppers is because the expensive one would sink while the cheaper one would stay afloat. And so as water would run its course, you would see the cheaper ones kind of floating around, almost like charred earth. The massive site-specific uh, installation and practically excavated artwork by Vivan assemble thousands of the 2,000-year-old pot shards. While much has been written about black gold through a civilizational narrative that it speculates through its ruins, I wanted to emphasize on the sea once again. The life of the sea is manifested in floods, typhoons, tsunamis, and other events often fatal to human life. W.J.T. Mitchell, Mitchell points out in Art History the that the flood is perhaps the oldest metaphor that humans have preserved from, uh, in the first Mesopotamian and then Abrahamic religions. The narrative of floods has been intimately connected with the formation of races in modern times and migratory patterns in contemporary times. Earth processes like volcanoes, fires, hurricanes, earthquakes, and tsunamis also continue to shape history in crucial and active ways. This is something that Amitav Ghosh dedicated an entire book to when he wrote The Great Derangement, elaborating on the fact that the environment has been an active agent, even a protagonist in history. So perhaps to add on to what Ashish was saying with regard to protagonists and the, and the absence of a protagonist to suggest a void, maybe we might also see the, some of Vivan's works where the absence of a protagonist is actually not an absence of a protagonist, but the foregrounding of the environment or the landscape itself as a protagonist and as an agent, where we, as all installation art often invites us, are the figures then, and not looking at a work with an absent figure. As we see works from the series, there's not so much of a civilizational ruin only, but a planet in a process of re-terrestrialization. The continuous movement of water, earth, and the black gold slash pepper accomplishes two significant moves, I feel. First, it abandons any notion of the earth as an absolute ground of itself, of history, of humans, or thought. The earth is not behaving like a good ground that it is supposed to be. The Anthropocene is less an age of humans than of the inhuman. The fact that there are no figures in all of these works is because we are the figures in relation to the artistic proposition, which has been the premise of all installation art in the first place, as I mentioned. Black gold invites you to think about the earth simultaneously on its being global in an economic and capitalist sense, planetary in a geological and ecological sense, and worldly in a political and social sense. And this brings me to terra optics. These are the installation views. Since the past four years, the pandemic changed the entire regime of visibility. It revealed new limits of perception, mediation, and representation in the current technological era. In its being global, planetary, and worldly, as I already described, the modes of knowing and experiencing the world on an individual and collective level, level simultaneously contracted and expanded. It is not coincidental how strikingly similar this sounds to the impacts of climate change. You can see it, but you can't see it. You can visualize it, but you can't visualize it. You can, well, usually visualize the symptoms of it, the storm. It's kind of like the way um, Ho Zinian speaks about the wind. You can't really see the wind until you see something being affected by the wind. 
Such convulgence have put to test the very apparatuses of language, science, governance, and social interaction. How does one visualize something that is so totalizing and yet so discreet, visible yet so occluded? What is the jurisdiction of these impacts when we start talking about them? And why I'm mentioning this is because of terra optics, because of the optic fiber cable. Terra optics is a continuation, extension, and an amplification of earth-changing and groundbreaking processes Vivan has extraordinarily been exploring through all of these years. This time, optic fibers coil in and out of view, radiant and hot. Some young artists, I don't know if some of them are present here, have been doing some really interesting research on this. Uh, Arushi Surana, Asma Tulika, Kaushal Sapre, and Ala Semens -Koya, uh, Koyava have been researching on the undersea cables around the world, citing that these cables account for around 97% of all internet data traffic on the planet. There are approximately, currently, 436 cable systems in service around the world, spanning over 1.3 million kilometers of planetary data metabolism infrastructure, weighing in at, at 1,400 kgs per kilometer for a total planetary weight of 1 billion, 820 million kgs. I know that these figures sound completely baffling and make no sense, but that's precisely the point, that it does not make sense. They are abstractions and yet they're indexical. And I think that's something that Vivan's kind of always very interested in. And therefore the indexical never pre uh, presents itself as indexical. Um, perhaps the traits, but also perhaps in excess of the traits. One third of these cables, in fact, are concentrated around the Red Sea, where the Houthi rebels right now in Yemen are waging war and trying to uh, basically protect the land of Yemen against both Saudi Arabia and the US and a lot of the NATO. Because a ship sank, a sank, a ship sank recently in the Red Sea, some of it is being alleged, allegedly a conspiracy by the Houthis, a lot of those Red Sea cables, one third of them, have been disrupted which is posing a lot of challenge and, and fear around uh, the, the health of the internet at the moment. All this being said, it is to say that the earth is where geopolitics meets biopolitics meets geoengineering. It is where terraforma meets terra nullis meets terraforming. Vivan spoke of slow time quite a lot when he was doing these works. I think the slow time might be glacial time but it's at the same time it has extreme magnitude and plays out on all kinds of other scales, which can seem very rapid right now. Um, I'm going to end on that, actually. I had a few images to so show, but I'm going to end on that just to say that I think there was something really extraordinary that Vivan was exploring, and I feel maybe some of it was conscious, some of it was intuitive, and this was, some of, this was where some of our conversations kind of ended uh, before I, I moved cities. And I hope I'll develop some of these. So thank you very much. I left an image of Vivan.
evening. I'd like to reiterate our thanks to Avijit Mukul Kishore, whose film you saw here, Anuradha Kapoor, who's uh, made a playlist for Vivan. Again, a reminder that you can actually either take a photograph of it, um, there are QR codes in the foyer outside, or just scan it and access the playlist of 15 tracks. Um, but also thanks to Ashish, Sabi, and Hemant. Thank you so much for this evening, and thank you all for joining us today. <laughs>